Hi, I'm Kathy Cool of Nelly Designs. I've been making candles for over a dozen years now, and even though my business has grown in that time, I'm still the one who pours all the candles using the tools you see right here. I've been using vegetable wax for a while. I really like it for a lot of reasons, and I've had a lot of success with it. But as every candle maker knows, whether you're using paraffin or vegetable wax, sometimes you run into an issue or two, especially if you're used to pouring with paraffin. The process for vegetable wax is slightly different. We're gonna cover that and all the best practices for how to get the most out of your vegetable wax. Pull away, cracking, fat bloom, mushrooming, tunneling, frosting. I've had to deal with them myself or talk to other candle makers about how to solve them. And that's what I'm gonna help you with today. And while I'm not a scientist, I am going to get a little help today from Cargill so we can show you some of the best practices and rules of thumb to pour a candle so you can get consistently good results and avoid these common issues. We'll talk about the specific parts of the process when we get there. But when you're working with vegetable wax, it's always important to be consistent, consistent, consistent. The more you can keep things like room temperature and humidity consistent, the easier it is to get the reliable results when pouring with vegetable wax. And every candle maker knows that you might need to test, test, and test again to find the right mix of fragrance and wick size for your candle. If you're already consistent with things you can control, like your process and temperatures, it just makes it easier to figure out which variables need to be adjusted because you'll be comparing apples to apples. Okay, let's start by talking about melting. Every candle maker starts by melting the flakes. I know some people melt in their microwave, which is fine if you're pouring a few candles, but for small to medium batches, a melter like this one is really useful. I'm using Cargill's Nature Wax C3 because I really like the way it burns, and it doesn't have that plasticky smell that you get with paraffin waxes, which is important if you're making scented candles the way I do. I also like the way the color looks. There are many advantages to using vegetable wax over paraffin, but the process pouring a vegetable wax candle is a little different if you're used to pouring paraffin candles. The melted liquid form of vegetable wax is thicker than paraffin, so more heat is needed to get the wax flowing to the flame. You'll need to use a thicker gauge wick than you would for a paraffin candle of the same diameter. While some vegetable waxes have a natural yellowish tint, Cargill offers premium grade vegetable waxes with exceptionally low color. No need to blend it with white paraffin, which could lead to issues like pull away. Vegetable wax is more opaque than paraffin, so you may have to test to find the right amount of dye to use if you're pouring a colorful candle. Vegetable cools at a different rate than paraffin waxes, so keep a consistent cooling temperature and stay within our recommended guidelines to avoid issues like blooming. You want to melt the wax flakes slowly so you don't burn them. Cargill has these handy sheets that recommend the best temperature ranges to melt and pour in, but you also have to keep ambient temperature and humidity in mind. Extreme ambient temperature and inconsistent humidity are two of the biggest culprits when it comes to issues with vegetable wax. Ambient temperature is the temperature of the room you're working in, and humidity is the concentration of water vapor present in the air. Both of these can affect melting, pouring, or cooling curves, so it's important to keep them both consistent in the room you're pouring in. I like to keep my studio at an even 68 degrees, and I'm gonna melt this wax at 185 degrees. Okay, while that's melting, let's talk about what you're going to pour the wax into and the importance of what choice. Whatever containers you're gonna pour your wax into, it helps to preheat them. I put mine in a warm bath, it warms them up slightly above room temperature, which is good because you don't want them hot, just room temperature or above. To avoid cracking or pull away, it's important to have an even pouring temp. A container that's warm, but not hot, will maintain an even pouring curve. But a container that's cold, or much cooler than the melting temperature, can affect the pouring temperature, causing the curve to be too steep. Preheating your container will prevent this. Wick selection is also really important, because if you don't get it right, you'll see problems like tunneling and the fragrance throw will be off, 
and other issues. There are a lot of different wicks you can choose from, but it's all about what kind of candle you're trying to make. So here are three things that guide my choice. Diameter of the candle, if I'm using fragrance or not, and the type of wax I'm using. With Nature Wax C3, the fragrance amount in these jars, which are about three inch in diameter, I like to use an Echo 14. It's cotton woven with paper. As more people are pouring with vegetable wax, suppliers are getting better and better about making wicks just for vegetable wax candles. So keep your eye out. Proper wicking is important to avoid tunneling, but also to get the best performance in terms of burn time, fragrance throw, and getting the cleanest burn. The candle on the left is underwicked, which leads to tunneling. The candle on the right is overwicked, causing the flame to burn tall and fast, creating too much heat that leads to pooling and excess carbon, or mushrooming, on the end of the wick. The candle in the middle is properly wicked. The ideal wick will burn with a flame 0.75 to 1.25 inches high, with a melt pool that reaches completely across the diameter of the candle. A good rule of thumb when testing wicks is to let the candle burn one hour for every inch of diameter. If after three hours you see a one inch tall flame and melt pool that reaches the edge of the container on a three inch candle, then you'll know you've properly wicked. If not, test, test, and test again. But make sure the only variable you're changing is wick gauge. Okay, I've dried the jars and we're putting the wicks in with their wick holders. Now that we're properly wicked, our candles have the best chance to have reliable burn times and the best fragrance throw. We're all set to mix in the fragrance and pour. Now that our wax has reached its melting temperature and is melted through, we can start pouring. Today, I'm gonna to use a nice light scent. Cargill recommends a fragrance load between 6% and 9% for the wax I'm pouring. And since this is a lighter scent, I find it helps to be at the higher end of that. So I'm gonna measure out 9%, but you should always check the recommended load for your particular vegetable wax. Fragrance load is the percentage of fragrance added to the wax. Overloading the fragrance could be costly and unnecessary, but underloading it will affect fragrance throw or the scent of the candle when it burns. If your fragrance is high in solvent or has other additives, it could lead to problems. But whether you're running into issues like cracking, fat bloom or you're getting a rough or cottage cheese texture on the surface of your candles, start by lowering the fragrance load and test. To find the perfect combination of fragrance, dye, and wick size, it's important to test, test, and test again. Here's how I measure out my fragrance load. I have a container that's teared or zeroed out, and I know I'm going to pour three 8-ounce candles today, so that's a total of 24 ounces. I want 9% fragrance load. So 9% of 24 is 2.16 ounces. Hey, Kathy, I know you said you weren't a scientist, but that was pretty good. Thanks, Cargill. Okay, now I pour that into my glass pitcher here and start to fold in the wax. You want to slowly fold in the wax with the fragrance, blending and mixing so the oil has bonded fully and completely to the wax, which usually takes me about five minutes. Now we've got our jars toasty and our fragrance oil has blended nicely with the wax. So are you ready? Let's check the temperature. Great, we're at 160 degrees, which is the perfect temperature to pour. So let's do it. This is the pouring curve. If the temperature is too high, it could lead to fat bloom. If it's too low, you might experience cracking, frosting, or filming. A good rule of thumb is to keep an eye on the room temperature when you pour. If your room temperature is between 70 and 80 degrees, your pouring temperature should be between 155 degrees and 170 degrees. If your room temperature is higher, say between 80 and 90 degrees, you'll want to pour at a lower temperature by 5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. For Celsius, that's 2 to 5 degrees. If your room temperature is 60 to 70 degrees, you'll want to increase your pour temperature by 5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Here's something to keep in mind. Larger candles will take longer to cool down, so it's important to compensate for this in the cooling curve by pouring at a slightly lower temperature. If you're pouring a 3-inch candle at 160 degrees, pour a 4-inch candle at 155 degrees. Always remember, humidity can have an effect on pouring temperature. If you can't control the climate of the room you're pouring in, 
then you can adjust the temperature at which you pour. When you test, make sure pouring temperature is the only variable you're changing. That's a good point. When I change temperatures, I do it five degrees at a time. Okay, looks good, but we're not done yet. Now, it might seem like our hard work is over, but we still have to pay attention to the ambient temperature. It's going to take at least 12 hours for these candles to cure. And to help them cool evenly, I space them about two inches apart. And make sure the ambient temperature of the room doesn't change overnight or over the day, depending on when you're pouring. This is the cooling curve. Cooling too fast can lead to cracking, filming, frosting, or pull away. Cooling too slow can lead to fat bloom or mushrooming. To avoid cooling too slow, use a fan for indirect airflow to help speed up cooling. To avoid cooling too fast, pay attention to ambient temperature in the room over the entire curing time. Being mindful of seasonal temperatures outside, make sure the room is consistently the same temperature and humidity over the entire cooling process. Being consistent in this part of the process is sometimes harder than you might think. I've heard stories of people leaving their candles to cool overnight and turning off the heat before they go, only to come back in the morning to a batch with a lot of cracking. Another candle maker told me they had a fan in the room, but it only cooled one side, and when they came back, the candles on that side of the room had all pulled away. I've even noticed that I need to keep a dehumidifier running in the humid summers and make sure the heat doesn't shut off in the cold winters. Now, it might take 12 hours to cure, but thanks to the magic of movie making, we're ready to do a test burn. So, we've let our candles sit for 12 hours. Now it's time to light them and see how they burn. But first, Let's take a moment to see how the wax is cured. These are pretty good. What do you think, Cargill? Before you light your candle, take a closer look at it. If there's pull away, try preheating your containers before you pour. If there's cracking, fat bloom, or even frosting, make sure to watch cooling temps so your candles aren't cooling too fast. You could also increase spacing between the candles as they cool and cure, and lower pouring temps. Okay, let's light them. When I do burn tests on a three inch diameter candle, I let them burn for three hours. Then I blow them out and I let them sit for a day before lighting them for another three hours. I find this gives the best sense of how well the candle burns, whether the wick is the right size or not, and whether the candle smells how I want it to when it's lit and just sitting on the shelf resting. A properly burning candle will have a 1 inch or 2.5 centimeter tall flame that burns steady, without too much flickering or waving. If the flame is too large and you're seeing mushrooming, the candle is overwicked. Try a smaller gauge. The wax should melt evenly out to the container. If the melt pool is more than a half inch deep, the candle is overwicked. If the melt pool doesn't reach to the container and you're seeing tunneling, the candle is underwicked. Try a larger wick gauge. But only change one thing at a time. That's right, Kathy. The best way to track down what may have gone wrong is to be consistent in the first place with as many variables as you can, especially temperatures, fragrance loads, and wick selections. If you do have issues, test, test, and test again, changing only one variable to experiment until you identify the source of the problem and solve for it. That's why it's important to start with small batches. These common issues happen a lot but they're also completely fixable and avoidable by candle makers. Most can be avoided by being consistent and paying attention to temperature, especially ambient temperature and humidity. Always follow our Nature Wax recommendations. And remember, if you're adding fragrance, other additives, or just mixing waxes, you're introducing another set of variables beyond things like wick selection. And if you want to fix small blemishes like slight cracking or frosting, you can try applying heat with a heat gun, but only do it sparingly. Overuse can affect the performance of the candle. If you're new to vegetable wax, there are a few new skills you might need to learn, but I think it's really worth it. I like Cargill's vegetable waxes because they generally burn longer than paraffin waxes, and you don't get that plasticky or petroleum smell. And that's how I pour candles. I hope this was helpful, and for tips and tricks and information on Cargill waxes, visit Cargill's website. Thank you and good luck. Visit us at naturewax.com.